Hey everyone, this is X O'Connor and you are listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This week's episode, we've got with us Mr. John Sell, who is director of a r at Capital CMG. He is a legendary man with tons of insight into artists wanting to get onto labels, what labels are looking for in artists, how to find your niche in the musical marketplace. And this episode is just jam-packed full of a professional's insight into what it takes to be successful in the music industry. So whether you're an artist, songwriter, producer, this man has thoughts for you on what the music industry is looking for if you're looking to get on with a label. So Listen in close, get those notepads ready. There's tons to take away from this episode. Before we jump in though, just want to remind everyone, if you want to keep up with all things Full Circle Music, please make sure to follow us on all social medias, including Instagram using at official FC Music. And of course, in iTunes, please leave us a review. We love hearing from you guys. We want to make the show better all the time. And so we love hearing your feedback. Leave us a review, subscribe to us, keep up with the show. Tons of great content still to come. But for now, let's just jump in here with John Sell. We often talk a lot to up and coming music makers, people who are looking to break into the music business. So why don't you talk about that? Like you're on the other side of the glass, so to speak. You know, people, maybe I'm not on the, the creation side, but you're on the, the label side. So for right. a, lot, a lot of people that maybe don't know your story, share a little bit of that. How did you get into it? Where are you at now? What label are you working at? What, what's some of the artists that you're working on? Yeah. So I'm from Ohio, good old Ohio. And grew up loving music, listening to it. Started playing some music. My family's musical, you know, always around it, loved it. In high school, I just I'd scour on pure volume. Oh yeah. Remember that site? That was Absolutely. my first that was my first upload site. Like I remember specifically remember, and it may still be out there. I don't know, but I, I went under the name Seth David. <laughs> nice Seth David. High school. Yep. <laughs> and I put a song up. And I got a message, or it, I think it let you know like where your people were listening from. Like you've got a follower in Georgia or something. And I remember specifically, just said like Dave, just listened to your song in Georgia. Yeah, and that was the craziest <laughs> feeling ever. <laughs> right, it was, it was free, and you're connecting with people from wherever. Yeah, it's it was kind of like the SoundCloud back in the late 90s, early 2000s. I don't even remember when it was. But So you were scouring per, per volume? You weren't uploading your I wasn't own stuff? uploading. I just looked for new bands and music to listen to and share with my friends. And then MySpace as well. You could find your top friends. And usually bands would pick bands that were like them as their top friends. And so... I remember that strategy as a band. Right. <laughs> it was a great strategy. <laughs> so I just always did that. The thing about it was I never knew you could kind of get paid to like look for new artists and try to sign them to record deals and stuff. I was clueless to that. But anyway, when I was looking to go to college, I was like, well, I'm going to go be a record producer in Nashville without really knowing anything about that or what that was. So you came in with the dream or the assumption that you were going to be a record producer. Yes. The naive dream. But I quickly realized like I did not have the attention span or the detail focus to sit on Logic or Pro Tools all day long and listen to the same four bars uh, <laughs> for hours or minutes or however quick you are. But we actually don't do that. It's, it's I one, do eight bars. One now. take. Yeah. <laughs> one take. <laughs> all the way through. Magic. So I ended up studying at Belmont quickly realized like that route isn't for me. I switched from music business to marketing and just kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I met a girl and this might be too personal. I don't know. Go for it. Met a girl. Not personal enough. She was nannying for Jeff Barry, who was at Eaglemont Entertainment at the time, which is a management company that Centricity had. And I interned. I basically just was like, hey, I'd love to see what you guys do. So I interned with them. That was my entire senior year at Belmont. And I was like, I actually do like the music business and the people here. It led to a marketing and promotion job that I did for three years. That's how we met Seth. Because you were in radio promotions. Yes. 
And that was that your sort of first paid gig in the industry then? Yes, it was. What did you think of radio promotions? Did you like it? I, I was clueless to really Christian radio because where I grew up, we didn't really have it. You could kind of, I knew there was a station called Air One. Did you, where you grew up in Ohio? Yeah. Uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Northeast. Yeah, the mafia shuts down most of the Christian radio. <laughs> <laughs> if you were in certain parts of town, you could get Air One. I think it came out of Pittsburgh or something like that. But yeah, I didn't really know that there was Christian radio all around the country. I'd get my records when I would buy them from like family Christian bookstores or eventually iTunes and that. But then I fell in love with Christian music because my sister would hand me her old DC talk and audio adrenaline records. And I was like, free music. Plus the music was great. So, <laughs> yeah. and it spoke into my life at the time. And anyway, all that to say, getting into the Christian music business was exciting at, out of college. And I was like, whatever job it is, I'll take it, you know? And Steve Ford hired me over there. He, you know, I handed him my resume. He's like, what do I need this for? I know you have no experience. What do you know about Christian radio? I said, nothing. He said, great. Well, I've heard you had good work ethic. We'll teach you. So that led into that position. And I did that for three years. It's when we met Seth doing some radio promo tours with me in motion back in the day. And eventually... I did what I always did back to going to Pure Volume. At this point, it was more of like Facebook and Instagram and iTunes. I'd kind of look for new music. I was at a record label. Still didn't really quite understand what A&R was. And you're at Centricity? Yes. So you moved from radio promotions to A&R. I, at this point, I hadn't. No. But you were still looking around. You're still pursuing. Yeah, cool, I was cool at a music. record label. I'd always look out, you know, the top. 10 every Tuesday at the time. It's Friday now. Who would pop up? What records I recognize? What I didn't? And see if there was anything interesting that showed up. Were you like looking at like top 40 kind of stuff? Or were you more like looking for like, you know, what's the underground cool thing? It really didn't up? matter. Like it was just, just anything that was cool. Yeah, that anything you liked. I liked yeah. and thought. I mean, mostly at that time, it was probably on the Christian page because I was working at a Christian label. And, you know, I, I never really found much, but at some points there was some cool things that I'd find. So what would happen when you would find something? I'd send it off to John Mays, you know, and that was maybe two or three times. I'd be like, this is interesting, but I knew he worked with the artists. And then eventually I got tired of promotion. It wasn't for me long-term. I'm more you know, I connect with artists and producers and the creative people more so than the radio side of things. And it just was naturally a fit for me to move into A&R. And he kind of saw that and he kind of brought that out of me, which I never thought I'd be good at it. I wasn't super musical. I, Why didn't you think you'd be good at it? I don't know, because I didn't understand it. You know, it's it's a highly relational job. I understand that now and I'm great at that. And so... He thought I would be good at it. He's like, why don't you come work for me? And I was like, awesome. Yeah, let's do this. So it took a little while to get the transition to happen. We had to find a person for me to fill my old spot. But John really took me under his wing and taught me a lot about A&R and making albums and finding artists. And one of the cool things was the one thing that I actually found that I sent to John was this band called The Assembly. And they were based out of Louisiana, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And Centricity would always do these artist retreats that were kind of like your boot camps, but up in Washington, in Winthrop, Washington. And we were looking for new artists, to independent artists to bring up there to teach them about the music business and us and it's kind of an A&R tool for them. And so I sent off this band, the Assemblies record to them and they ended up inviting them to the retreat. And there was a background singer on this record who was a girl who didn't really know who she was. They invited her too. And that girl ends up being Lauren Daigle. And 
then she, you know, the rest is kind of history there. So I That's think that story has awesome. been told on your podcast already. <laughs> so it, it has. Yeah. And it's, it's just crazy because it's like you never know where the next hit is going to come yep. from. Right. Background singer on a record that's just found by just combing through some stuff. Yeah. And I don't even, you know, for what it's worth, I don't even, I remember there being a girl on it, but I don't remember like... Like, do you even remember hearing her or anything? Like, was she even singing or was she the like the lead background singer? It was more of background. I think it was a little bit of a feature, but... I could be totally wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was somewhere in the assembly. It was the assembly yeah. had it in there. I liked the band, the assembly. It was cool, you know. And I was just like, check these guys out, John. And and then next thing you know, they invite them up to this retreat. And yeah. So my wife just texted me and she's like, I forgot to tell you, and, and you'll appreciate this. She said, I forgot to tell you that Melina, our month old just slept a five hour stretch. Oh, praise God. Last night. That is awesome. <laughs> For those of you out there, listeners in full circle music land, <laughs> that is a miracle. For <laughs> right. A one month old. So that's a sidebar. You have kids now. I have two kids. How old? Three and one. Yeah. So, so they're girl along and for boy. the ride. Somewhere along the way you found yourself over at Capital yeah. CMG, which is where you're at now. Right. Can you talk about that journey? What have, you know, what kind of led to that? Right. So I had met Brad through Steve Ford actually one day. He was meeting with Brad before I was Steve's next meeting. And Brad, who I had known about, didn't know about me, but I met him and he was like, hey man, let's get coffee sometime. And I, I was like, dude, you've made so many albums that I love and have bought and listened to and work with a lot of artists that I grew up on. And so it meant a lot to me. I was probably 24 at the time. And we just kind of would meet occasionally. I never was like, this will lead to a job with him or anything like that. I just liked him and could learn from him. And Eventually, so being at Centricity, working on Lauren's record, working on Jordan Feliz's record and a few others, he just kind of took interest in me some more. And then they were looking to bring somebody on board over there at Capitol. And he called me up and we got together and talked about a position. And at first I was kind of like, man, this is this is not good timing. Like I had some (laughs) great artists on my roster and loved those artists and still do and was looking forward to working with them. And it just wasn't the plan, you know, that I feel like God had for me. And, And part of that was, I think I'd been at Centricity for about six years at the time. And it's the only thing I had ever known. And I think... I was getting probably a little bit comfortable maybe of just not feeling... I knew I could continue learning from those people and they're great people. I'm still close with all of them. But I felt like, man, I feel like I need to go somewhere else to keep growing. Yeah, it's like sometimes the change itself, not even a better or worse situation, but just the change alone is enough to kind of break you out of a a rut maybe. Right. Not that you're in a rut, but like I know what you're saying. Yeah, just from being complacent yeah. almost. Yeah, yeah that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, and I, I don't think I was at that point at all. I, I think it was just... You were in a rut and you were complacent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're That's telling. what we're saying. We're saying. <laughs> there was no rut, no complacency. <laughs> There's excitement for the future. You know, I think it was like... I told John when I was about to leave, I said, you know, I feel like, like you guys taught me how to walk here and it's amazing and I've appreciated all the time here. I need to go somewhere to learn how to run, you know. I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but... I was just taking next steps. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. the progression. Yeah. So you're at Capital now and, you know, essentially kind of doing same role, A&R, looking for new artists, working with artists on their records. What are your strategies nowadays for finding artists? Are you still doing the Instagram, Facebook, I mean, YouTube, that whole thing? Yeah, I definitely do. It's probably less of that. Spotify is amazing for that. You know, anybody could put their music up on Spotify. 
you can see how it's reacting. You can see the number of streams next to it. I found a few artists that I'm talking to that way. Found an artist uh, on Facebook I'm talking to. But still the best way is probably word of mouth. So are you just literally going on Spotify and searching Christian music and seeing what comes up? Or how are you even discovering yeah. these artists? And how do you even know if they're like a Christian artist? Like, Because I would assume that's kind of what you're... Yeah, you'd have to like intentionally find it that way. Yeah, Lyrically, you listen to the lyrics, you can kind of tell. You can also tell... If it's on Instagram, you can look at who their friends are and who they like. If they like a bunch of Christian pastors, it's like, or <laughs> Christian artists, you're like, okay, this guy yeah. might have some a faith background. But it's not even that because we have a couple artists that are on our roster that are making mainstream music. And so it just has to be music that I kind of connect with and think there's potential for it to be commercial, you know. I haven't signed anybody like that yet or like just from like finding somebody on Spotify and right. seeing it all the way to a record deal. But it's it's a relational thing from there and I've definitely struck up relationships that way. And that may lead to a signing someday. Exactly. But I'd still say that the biggest the best way to find an artist is trusted relationships, a word of mouth from someone you trust, whether it's a manager, a friend who has, you know, a good ear for talent and music. I first heard about Jordan through, I think it was Sam Tenez. And then who will be here in approximately 13 minutes. I, was gonna say, <laughs> nice. I thought I saw his name on the calendar. <laughs> Small world. And then also a friend of mine named Jennifer Dibler told me she met him in downtown Franklin by the Starbucks, you know, and just struck up a conversation. So a few touch points there. And it was like, okay, there might be something here. I need to dig into this, see what's going on with Jordan. And at that time, I think his band was called like The Current or something. And then that... Current Affair. Well, it was The Current Affair. Oh, they dropped The Affair. Okay. Then it was just him as The Current. And then they dropped The Current and just went with Jordan. Okay. Please. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that... All those ways are good ways of finding artists. So once somebody gives you a referral like that, what are some of the things that, okay, you're sitting down with them, talking with them over a period of, you know, I would imagine it's somewhat like dating where you kind of meet an artist and, you know, you're obviously trying to fill each other out and everything, but what are some of the things that you're looking for right. with an artist that might be a good fit for you? Well, definitely, I'd say like talent is... There has to be some sort of talent there. It can be songwriting, an exciting music or story that's happening, like a, a consumer story. Like people, this artist is independent, but people are listening to this artist and streaming and actively seeking to go to shows or follow their socials or any of that stuff. I think a great live show or the potential to have a great live show is important. If it's a band, a great front person, or if it's a solo artist, they just, they have to be compelling, not only in a live setting, but in interactions with people. And because they're going to be interacting with a lot of different types of people and radio promotion and PR and accounts like Spotify and iTunes and all of that. A good team around them, whether it's a manager, an agent, a producer, a songwriting crew or producer team. I think vision and message kind of align, but vision is big because if an artist comes in with no vision, it's hard to have a vision for them. And it's hard to have that vision that they might one day like wake up and be like, well, this isn't what I actually wanted to do with my artistry. Why am I here? And it's because it was probably somebody else's vision, whether it's an A&R or a manager kind of leading the way. So some way to shape their vision or help them just refine it and focus it if it's not super direct. And then I'd say what kind of encompasses all that is hard work. Nobody will care about the artist's career more than the artist's. And if there are artists that other people care about their career more, that's probably an issue. It's the same for you and me, you know? 
nobody can care for my career more than I can. And so it's important for them to have that hard work because it's a motivator for the team that's around them to know that this artist has vision and they have hard work and talent. They have everything that they need and they're going to lead the charge and go after it. Yeah. So let's talk about from the artist perspective, what are some no-nos or, or things that an artist shouldn't do when they're like interacting with you, when they're courting a record label? It's a good question. And you can use specific <laughs> examples. <laughs> they Sometimes are encouraged. Seth Mosley, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say just don't walk into a meeting unprepared. You know, if it's a first meeting or something like that, and just be willing to... We don't ask a lot of new artists that we meet with that we're beginning, you know, the relationship thing with. But I think if you come in unprepared and you don't know like why you're there or what you want to be doing. It's hard for the A&Rs or the people in the meeting to see the artist's ambition, to see like, do they want to be Christian or do they want to be mainstream? Do they want to be both, which is really yeah. hard. That's such a good, I mean, I hope listeners out there you take a note. That's a wisdom bomb right there. Never walk into a meeting unprepared. What are some of the things that you guys would consider that? Like, talk about maybe a meeting that went really well and maybe one that felt like it did not. Yeah. We have a lot of meetings go well and it's just because they come in prepared. They know who we are. They know what we, we're about and they can articulate what they want to do and accomplish Bad meetings. I've had a few that you just want to kind of get out of. I won't use any names, but I think this one time one artist realized like I wasn't going to give him a contract right then and there. <laughs> and we listened to some of his music and I made some comments on it. Not that nothing negative yeah. or and, you know, I, I don't know if he read me and was like, oh, he's not excited or what, but he like stood up and he's like, it was like uncomfortable. He's like, it's time, time to go. Like, and I, I was like, okay. <laughs> he's just calling it on yeah, his own. He he's stood like, up. He's, he was ready to leave because I wasn't about to sign him right then and there. Wow. Nor, yeah. I mean, nor do I have that power to just write a napkin, you know, yeah. or would that be smart? <laughs> yeah. I, I have to, I have to get my team on board with things. So yeah. it's. Artists do not expect your first meeting to end in a record deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a great piece of advice. <laughs> maybe so, after, if like if it's a great meeting, like maybe yeah. after the fact. Yeah. Like, you but, don't, you don't have an iPad with want DocuSign to, out yeah. ready. <laughs> yeah, we generally well, yeah, this right meeting there with went the well. deal on there. <laughs> just, just initially, <laughs> we. Just, I mean, you hear those stories sometimes. Who knows if they're yeah. true? But yeah, we wrote the contract on a napkin. But generally, we want to be the touch point between the artist and the rest of the label. If we like somebody, then we'll bring them back in to meet with more of the team, with our president, with our marketing team, and radio teams. And so it's a long process. Some of them are a year or two. Some of them are two months. But when we get behind an artist, we want to feel the whole building excited and on board with getting behind an artist. Talk about, because there's we, we always have this conversation with, with artists and folks on this show, on Full Circle Music Show, label versus independent. Yeah. Because even you, you just said the guy, you know, you're not going to get a deal. First meeting guy stands up, walks out. So obviously there's some artists out there with a uh, shorter level of patience and you're saying it might take, you know, two years to get signed to a I major hope label that's deal. that's not the case. Yeah. That's a long time. But what, yeah, but why go with the label over just being an indie guy? You know, I think there's this notion that labels are out to get artists or, you know, there's negativity around all that. That's not been my experience. Now I work at a label, so, and I'm not an artist, so I don't fully understand the artist perspective, but we generally want to get behind and support our artists. And like I said, their vision. And if they can all align, then great. Where you see label versus independent come up a lot is I don't know it seems a lot more in the mainstream with like Chance the Rapper and he he's you know 
bragging on Sony record. Like, I don't know if you've seen the slides on his show, but generally speaking, I mean, even Chance, he has a label behind him. He just doesn't call it a label. It's a team. His team but is... It's, but it's a label though. Right. Is, I don't know. Does he call it a label? Well, I mean, what's a label? It's a team. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that's what I'm trying to say is at some point, all artists to take their careers to next levels, they need a team around them. Sometimes that looks like a label. Sometimes it looks like their own built team that actually is kind of like their own label. So people sign to labels for a lot of reasons. I'm sure we've all heard of them, you know, whether it's relationships, experience, money, the team aspect, I think is the most important part of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you touched on that. I mean, often in the beginning, artists don't have access to unlimited financial resources too. So everything costs a lot of money. Like, right. I mean, it doesn't have to, but like you still got to spend money to hire a producer to do a record. Got to get somebody to do your video content. You've got to get you need the marketing help. If you're going after Christian music, you need radio, which costs a lot of money. So team, finances, is there anything else that you feel like would be an advantage? Yeah, I mean, I just think access to accounts and those things with the experience and the relationships that we have. I mean, we have people that do streaming. We have people that like they work with Spotify. That's their entire job or Apple or... Amazon, you know, so on top of that, just we have people that do video for YouTube and work with YouTube a ton. And so it's very specialized and specific and you can't just go into Spotify and have relationships there who are going to help you. Well, why are they going to trust you? Like right. if you've never done anything. Right. So it makes total sense. And I think generally radio and Spotify and all those, they want to get behind artists that have a great team behind them. So they're not investing in like one song versus like, okay, this artist is going to have multiple hit songs behind them. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. As we're kind of wrapping up, I always think there's so much to be learned from our successes in the music industry. But I think the times that we learn the most are actually our failures. So would you care to share, you know, one of your failures and and maybe something that you learned from it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this this one was was hard to think about. But we don't want to think about it, right? It's like those are the things that we try to like Yeah, we we brush over those. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, that, that happened. didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you about this other thing. Right. <laughs> I think the things that my biggest failures or maybe disappointments come when I feel like I didn't handle something appropriately or I didn't care for the relationship as well as I should have or communicate that right. I think when it's giving disappointing news like I, or conflict, like that stuff is hard for me okay. and sharing disappointing news is hard. Like whether it's dropping an artist or having a tough conversation or a single didn't work or an album didn't work. Those things, you know, nobody sets out to have those conversations, but they're necessary. And I don't want to name any specific things, but ahead of it, you're dreaming, you're hoping for what something can be. And then when it just doesn't happen, in, especially in the artistic process with an artist, it's disappointing because it feels like you put all this work in and you just, you don't get to determine the results. Brad you know, I'd sit in his office and be discouraged about something. And he'd be like, man, you know what? You can A&R the process. You can't A&R the results. And that's, that's, that's gold yeah, right that's there. Big. And I think he would quote Peter York as saying that. So that to me has been like, it takes some of the pressure off. And what you can do is working with the process and, but the results just aren't up to you. And so that's pretty vague on a failure, but that's a big takeaway from it. Yeah. You learn that 
all you can do is show up and do your best. And ultimately, whether you're an independent artist or label or producer trying to make it in the industry, the outcome isn't always predictable. And most of the time, it's not. Right. So I think that's a great takeaway. And I, I've worked on records just as hard as I have others. And some have been really awesome and great and sold well. And some of them just haven't, you know? And yeah, and it's it's not that you're doing anything different. I think a lot of the artists have this perception that, well, this other artist worked on the label, so the label must have been doing something different for them than they were doing for us. And in reality, it's really not ever the case. Right. Like, once you do catch some fire, that may help with, you know, the label investing more into it. But on the front end, which is the development stage, I mean you guys probably aren't doing anything different from one artist to another. I would say, depending on what that artist is doing, yes. But in the A&R process, no. So if it's like a more pop artist, okay, generally it's like a more radio-driven route. If it's a if it's a worship artist, it's more like, okay, how do we build your church platform? Yeah, but you're not giving one less attention than the other. Right. You're still having to work for all of them. Right. Exactly. But I would say too that the goal would be to be able to at some point give them less attention. Because you're starting with them, you know, at the beginning of their artist life as a baby and you're trying to help them grow up. And so in the front end, it's a whole lot of attention. Hopefully towards later in their career, it's a little bit less attention. If you sign great artists, it's a whole lot easier. Yeah. You build that trust over time. Exactly. Yeah. And they just get better, which yes. is the big thing. John Cell, Capital CMG. Thank you so much for taking the time today to be here with us. Dude, this was fun. I've been waiting for you to give me the call. I, you might have run out of everybody else to interview. <laughs> Not at all, man. And I'm here now. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the time. Awesome. Man. See you guys. Hey, this is X O'Connor, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jordan Salamoni. Stay tuned next week. We've got another killer episode coming, something that's near and dear to our hearts, but you'll have to tune in to find out what that is. And also, please rate us and leave us a review here on iTunes. We love hearing from you. We want to know what you guys think of the show. And also,